This is it, neighborhood. The last 12 hours and some change. So, well, the last almost 12 hours of 2023. And, oh, man, it's, yo, it's, it's been a hell of a roller coaster. Like, 2023 from, oh, God, excuse me, from start to finish has been a year full of, It's been a year full of ups and downs. It's been a year full of, you know, new releases. It's been a year full of controversies. A year full of changing of the guard in so many different ways. And, honestly, I think this year, well, I would say this year has been the most consistent that I have been able to actually stream ever since I first started this channel. And it comes down to two things. One, it comes down to the events that led up to me almost losing my life back in January. But it also comes down to, well, all of you. You know, if, you know, I don't care if it's two of you or 20 of you. The fact that y'all would come out to, you know, hang out with me every day or, you know, every other day or every week, you know, whenever you get the chance to make it out. The fact that y'all show up and, you know, hang out with me while I stream and while we, you know, discuss gaming and, you know, pop culture as a whole, you know, this, that right there. That's what made it possible for this stream to continue. You know, that's what made it possible for us to actually you know, keep going for as long as we have. For me to keep fighting for as long as I have. Because, you know, if it makes things worth it when it makes things worth it when you don't feel like you're going to be alone. You know? And I mean, you know, it's different when you're by yourself, you know? Being by yourself and being alone are two very different things. And I'm really glad that... I'm really glad that over the course of 2023, I wasn't alone. You know? I had friends to help me recover from what happened back in January. I had you guys to help, you know, to help me keep focused as I recovered and as I, you know, rebuilt my life. So, yeah, before we uh before we get started, you know, discussing the year in gaming as a whole, I really just wanted to take this time to say, well, thank you, you know, and I know I've said it, I know I've said it numerous times over the course of the year, you know, during, you know, various important days over the course of the year, but at the same time, you know, at the same time, you know, it just doesn't feel like I've said enough as far as how much I appreciate you guys and how much uh, you know how, how much y'all have literally helped make this year one of the most consistent for this channel and you know one of the best years personally for me you know So yeah, Blue, good to see you in, and, well, to you being literally one of my, one of my first subscribers and the most consistent, brother, thank you. Alright, so before I get too pensive and too sentimental here, 
let's get down to brass text. Let's get down to the reason why we are here in the first place, and that is to discuss 2023 as, you know, that's discuss 2023 as it pertains to gaming and pop culture. You know, this is, this is the, you know, this is the first of what I hope are many, you know, the first annual Top Shelf Awards. You know, this is, this is me going back over everything I've played, everything I've seen over the course of the year, discussing it with y'all, and, uh, let y'all know personally what I would recommend as my top picks for game of the year overall, as well as, you know, as well as in various categories, and just, you know, you know, basically recapping the year and having ourselves some fun over the next four and a half, five hours or so, you know, just really seeing the year off with some good vibes. So, as such, you know, we're going to be going through a variety of games over the course of the stream, you know. A few I was able to pick up on the cheap, like Blaze, like Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle, the Rumblefish Plus, and the Rumblefish 2. Now, those two... Those fighting games I just mentioned have a bit of a special place in my heart, and I'll let y'all know about that, or, you know, give you the basic ace lore behind that in a little bit. But, you know, if y'all are coming in to hang out, have some fun, maybe, you know, have a little food once intermission hits, and just chit-chat and, you know, relive the good times that we had over this past year as we head into the next, then y'all know what to do. Pull up a chair. Kick up your feet. Just remember to leave your shoes at the front door so that way we don't get any footprints on the tile, the carpet, or the furniture. So to start our year-end celebration, I'm kind of feeling like popping into Warframe for a little bit while we start the discussion. So with that being said, it's game time. Ah, woo. Winner, good to see you. I know it's already, uh, I know it's already, you know, getting later in the evening over there where you are, you know, eight, eight hours ahead. You're just a little ways off from, you're just a little ways off from sliding into 2024 yourself. I believe I was in the middle of doing something on this game. I'm trying to remember what. Uh, cool. Oh, that's right. I was leveling that up. But I also need to double check here. Oh, lovely. Everything in its place. Okay, we're on the... Are we on the steel path? Yes, we are. Let's check the circuit. Okay, so... We haven't hit the reset yet. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to jump over to the... I'm going to pop over to the Zeramin real fast. And see if Cavalero's got that Incarnon Genesis on sale yet as part of his rotation. Oh, but man, just to, you know, just to get us started. You know, just to kind of recap 2023. I got to, you know, I got to recap what happened back in January for, you know, those of you that came in later. Those of you that, you know, have, you know, didn't really catch up with me during the first half of the year. You know, just to give you an idea of where we're coming from. All right. So, just to get a little personal here, I was in a, I was in a long-term relation in eight, nine years, right? And long story short, things, 
things with my ex ended in a dramatic, near-fatal fashion. Uh, unfortunately, you know, my ex was actually a rather major part, well, not only a rather major part of my life, but also a rather major part of the, rather major part of the Twitch channel, you know, behind the scenes. You know, the, you know, a lot of the branding as far as like, you know, the character sprite that you normally see to identify me in, you know, what promotion I've done for the channel and even in my avatar and stuff on, on Twitter, you know, a lot of that, a lot of that visual design stuff, that was her. But things didn't work out. I damn near died. Be it's like, I damn near died because of it, because of her. We can leave the gory details out. But what I can say is that as of January 20th of 2023... My life underwent a drastic change, a drastic shift. Spent the next... Uh, spent the next month... Displaced from my home. Technically homeless. But after finally being able to come back... And after being able to take a couple of days to just kind of... Reset myself. You know, I came to the conclusion that, you know, if I was going to life again, then the best I could do is get back to doing what I love to do. Get back to doing what I enjoy doing. In addition to still working and, you know, trying to, you know, keep up with my, keep up with my responsibilities. <clears throat> and the first thing I thought of as far as getting back to stuff that I love to do well the first thing I actually thought of was martial arts you know keep myself fit keep myself active but following that up was gaming streaming and pretty much ever since then I want to say mid-February it's been Ever since then, I've been just, you know, damn near daily, just consistently streaming and, you know, uploading as regularly as I possibly could, uploading the VODs as regularly as I possibly could to YouTube, trying to, you know, not even crank out content so much as just get back into gaming and interacting with people again. And being able to do so has let all the system see that the Zeraman is defended. If I can say that now, you know, considering you know a lot of the sh considering a lot of what I had to deal with. One would imagine that, you know, yes, I've had to go to therapy. I have gone to therapy. I have been going to China therapy, you know, trying to keep myself side. level. But the best... I can honestly say that while, while speaking with a professional has helped, I really feel like the bulk of... You know, the lion's share of the work in terms of just helping me rebuild myself mentally and emotionally has just come from this. Come on. Needs too. It's come from streaming. It's come from, you know, getting back in touch with people on Twitter and just, you know, cutting out as much of the drama from my life as possible. And when I say cutting it out... I mean, quite literally just, you know what, I want to put my focus on stuff that makes me happy. If it's something that's going to stress me out, or cause me to get mad, then I just pivot. 
I don't even bother. It's like... I focus on gaming. I focus on streaming. And just inputting more of my energy into stuff that makes me happy and that I hope makes you know others happy. Just as a byproduct, my life, my overall demeanor, my mental health, my mental stability, my mood has just progressively improved. And then, you know, over the course of that, we've gotten to play some pretty fucking awesome games that have released this year. We've gotten to, you know, we've gotten to see the gaming landscape shift in real time. You know, we've gotten to really sit down and pay attention to it. You know, keep our, you know, keep our eyes and our fingers on the pulse of this hobby and industry that we love so much. And now, now, we're here to talk about some of the stuff that has, you know, really held really held and captured our attention and just made it made this year you know the best of this year I should say you know where we get to finally discuss what you know what has stood out in 2023 before we do that winner my condolences man I It was a couple years back, but literally, yeah, lo uh, losing losing both of, losing my grandmother on both sides of my family was rough. So I, hell, losing any sort of family is rough. So I, I can definitely see how that right there would be a pretty painful start to the year. But you know, hopefully, just as I have. You know, hopefully things have turned around and hopefully you've made you know you've made something of a 180 and have gotten yourself onto you know onto a more positive track he'll stop repeat <laughs> most of you kids made it hmm? so it's got to be worth something so you interested in custom tune-ups for your gear let's see extra Bor, Gamacore, Anku, Gorgon. Uh, whatever. Nothing about the customs. Well, let's look at Feeling it. creative? Ooh, I'm missing a few pathos clamps and the Yao shrubs, so I'm gonna have to start farming for stuff in Duberry. Pathos clamps, Yao shrubs. So yeah, it's just pathos clamps and yaw shrubs. I got two vastos there. I've got one there. Kill ten enemies within eight seconds, ten times. Here's where it gets interesting. Okay, later. All right, so I know what I've got to do there for now. But let's also uh. Let's pop back to the uh, orbiter and head over to the uh, sanctum. Yeah, I I feel that you know work getting rougher and rougher, or like myself, looking for work getting rougher and rougher as the as the year goes on. Hmm. But let's go ahead and get started, shall we? As far as Game of the Year discussion. Now, I'm going to kind of treat this like how I treat my reviews. 
you know, we're going to start with, you know, games that I feel, you know, games that I feel from what I've played have, you know, the most standout audiovisual merits, you know, games that stand out the most from a mechanical standpoint, positive or negative. You know, games that have the most standout stories and narratives, and then, you know, we'll end it, or at least, you know, like the latter portion of it, the more targeted discussion is going to be focused on games that I feel have given the best value proposition, and those will oh, very likely the dovetail. Are not laughing at my jokes. Did they adapt to my humor? Those will very likely dovetail into my, you know, into my top picks, you know, my top shelf picks for Game of the Year. Now, take note. I, you may have already seen me mention these games, so it may not come as much of a surprise. But at the same time, you know, I don't mind going back over them and discussing them in detail with y'all. Just, you know, just so that I can not only tell you guys, you know, let you guys know what's on my mind, but also see what's on your minds, too. You know, it's, yes, it's, it's a, you know, it's a very subjective listing but at the same time who have we got on the line till then at the same time as a subjective listing i also feel again it'll be a great piece of conversation because you know we don't all have the exact same taste in games we may have some overlap we may have a lot of overlap But no two people are exactly alike. You know, it's like it's like this great quote that I heard back when I was a teenager. Opinions are like assholes. Everybody has one and they all stink. So if you keep if and you keep that in mind, what in world is going on with the texturing on this floor? But anyway, you know, just just keep that in mind. We're not we're not all going to have the same opinions on the same games. We're not we're not all going to have, you know, the same games as what we would consider our personal game of the year. But it's good to compare notes. Good to see you, Blue. Welcome back. Welcome back. So, let's start with... Let's start with your favorite rookies' top shelf picks for best, for best visual design and best audio design. Best AV of 2023. Now, there's going to be some obvious bangers here, right? You know, while it can be said that, you know, good graphics do not a video game make, it certainly can help, but more than anything, it's not just good graphics, but good visual design. Killer visual design can make or break a game. It doesn't matter if it's AAA, doesn't matter if it's middle market, doesn't matter if it's garage band. If you got a game that looks and sounds fantastic, then you are very likely going to have yourself a hook that's going to draw people in to really to really try and see what what your game is all about. You know, it's, you know, your visual design is the wrapper. Now, it's just a matter of whether or not, you know, what's inside the wrapper is just as good as what's on the outside, right? Now, when it comes to visual and audio design, I have seen, I have seen Hi-Fi Rush bandied about 
a lot. And from what I've seen of the game, yeah, it... Hell, I wouldn't mind getting my hands on a copy at some point. I might wind up getting it, you know, sometime over the course of 24. I wouldn't mind getting my hands on a copy and, you know, going ham on it. You know, get, getting in there, playing it myself to see what all the fuss is about. Now, remember what I said, you know? Remember what I said. Good visual design, a good, a good attractive rapper makes people curious about what's going on on the inside, what's going on under the hood. I'm curious. I'm curious, and I would eventually like to pick that up for myself. So, if nothing else, an honorable mention for a game that I haven't played but still looks and sounds fantastic, Hi-Fi Rush has definitely taken that spot. Now, I actually did try to, you know, do a few notes. Trust me, next year, next year I will be more prepared, <laughs> okay? Next year I will definitely be more prepared for the actual discussion itself. But, uh... If there is one game that I will say is a standout masterpiece for me as far as you know, as far as visual design, as far as killer audio. While I absolutely love, you know, well, I absolutely love Final Fantasy 16 and Armored Core 6, I gotta say it, you know, my standouts are actually, you know, the more comparatively middle market stuff. Because, you know, it's it's not only great visually, it's not only great in audio, but there's also that vibe that you get that really takes you back to, or at least takes me back to some of my favorite years, not just in pop culture, but in gaming as a whole. And yes, Chop, yes, sir, Cookie Cutter. Both Cookie Cutter, we've, we've got two here. So, top Shelf going specifically to audiovisuals, Top Shelf AV for 2023 goes to Cookie Cutter and Bomb Rush Cyberfunk. Both of those games, much like I said when I was reviewing Cookie Cutter the other day, both of these games, from an audiovisual standpoint, have... they have really built and defined their own unique silhouette. Cherry is an inch is an instantly recognizable character. You know, the different you know, the different colors and the different theming used in both of those games, both Cookie Cutter and and BRC. When you look at Cookie Cutter, you think, you know, you got the neon purple and black. You've got the cyber... You know, you got the authoritarian cyberpunk dystopia. Cookie Cutter, you mention that game and you can immediately see just little tidbits of it. And go, okay, I know what you're talking about. Bomb Rush Cyberpunk, same thing. Great distillation of it, Blue. It is... It is... Dreamcast nostalgia and Dreamcast aesthetic perfected. Once again, you've got, you know, you've got the neon, you know, you've got the vibrant yet not overly visually damaging neon, you know, colors and color palette. You know, the neon greens and oranges, you know, you get, you know, that sort of you know, that sort of Tokyo Street vibe. You know, you think Tokyo Street vibe. You think the early 2000s. You think the Dreamcast. You think Dreamcast, and usually the first games that come to mind are stuff like Sonic Adventure and, of course, Jet Set Radio. And the moment you think Jet Set Radio, you're like, man, how come they haven't remade that? Oh, wait, there was that one game. Bomb Rush Cyberfunk. 
three words. Three words. With number one, a nod to music, radio, and cyberfunk. One word in the title, of course, relating to speed, jet, rush. And then the rest just kind of fills itself out. But again, you think of Bomb Rush Cyberfunk, and it's like you can already start hearing something, if not the actual music from the game, something resembling that music. And then that starts conjuring up the images of the game. And again, the colors, the mobility, the setting. Let's go back to Cookie Cutter one more time. Oh. Ooh, it it may very well. The new JSR may very well have its work cut out for it. If it... Like, JSR has got to do what Bomb Rush did. And that's take the core of JSR, respect it, refine it, and build on top of it. If the new JSR can do that, if the new JSR can do that, then it it it's in it's in great shape. Oh, uh, I remember tidbits about it from that's been coming out, talking about how the new JSR is actually going to be, you know, is going to be open world, right? Now here's the thing. JSR and JSR Future? Both of those games already are open world. Just not with a fully interconnected, you know, seamless transition, seamlessly transitioning map. But Tokyoto, Bentencho, you know, all, you know, all the different, you know, all the different districts in Tokyoto. Or, you know, the different boroughs in Bomb Rush. They're interconnected. It's just, you know, back in the Dreamcast era, the tech wasn't advanced enough to where you could actually seamlessly load the maps between regions. But now it is. So let's wait. So let's, let's wait and see what comes up as far as gameplay goes. Yeah, the Xbox hard drive changed things considerably. But yeah, just to, you know, just to kind of put a fine point on that for now. Like the of the games that I've played this year that have the best like most standout audiovisual design Andre, great to see you. You got in just in time. We basically just covered the first topic for the, uh, you know, the first topic for my, you know, top shelf awards picks for game of the year. Best audio, best audio visuals go to two, and you know, again, putting a fine point on that, that's going to be Bomb Rush, Cyberfunk, and Cookie Cutter. If you want games with fantastic visual design, and great music that matches up to it again there are the there are the obvious picks you know folks are going to say Baldur's Gate folks are going to say Final Fantasy 16 you know the big triple A ones but do not sleep on Bomb Rush Cyberfunk or Cookie Cutter those two games if you want truly great experiences from a visual and audio design standpoint Those two have, those two have got to be it. You know, yeah, Street Fighter Six, Street Fighter Six. Not gonna lie, the game looks, the game looks great.
There we go. Now we're getting that damage to spread. Oh, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? There we go. That's what I need to do. I need... I need to mod these blades for gas and electric, so that way I can finally make use of that arcane. That's where my issue lies. Well, let's see if I can get a decent run through this and level it up. You know what? Yeah, we can... We can definitely put voice acting in its own... We can definitely put voice acting in its own category as far as audio design because there's so much of it that's being done and so much that goes into it that, yeah, you gotta treat it like a separate facet of a game. And like, if you if you really want my pick for best voice acting, then yeah, no no question about it. I gotta give it to Final Fantasy 16. Not only, not only was the English dialogue for 16 well written, not only was it incredibly well written, but again, the direction, the performances, I mean, sure, Ben Ben Starr is, is the most notable because, you know, Clive. You know, he's the main character. He's the guy you hear the most over the course of the game. But when you've got a killer supporting cast, too, when you've got a killer supporting cast, plus, again, great direction... All you, all you can get from that is just bangers. So, big, big shout-outs to the remainder, to the rest of the cast, especially, especially the voice actors for, uh, like, especially the VO artists for, you know, Sid. Yeah, Ralph Ineson, Stuart Clark, all... Uh, I forget the lead, well, both of the ladies who performed as Jill and Benedicta. Oh, looky. Here we go. But I mean, every... Everyone in the game, from their vocal performances to their characterizations, are just great. <laughs> yes! Dude, that is such a... That is such a great way to describe it. Her, vo her voice is like... 
her voice is like audio chocolate. Smooth. Decadent. Like... I mean, the the woman, Ni Nina Yindis herself could just say, hello, how are you doing? And the first, the first words that would pop out of my mouth would be, are you trying to seduce me, madam? That, that is the kind of voice that she has, and it lends, her voice lends itself so well to Benedicta as a character. Like, it's perfect perfect casting Bro. like I, I honestly feel like every Everyone in that game, everyone in Final Fantasy 16 was cast immaculately. I have opened a new data conduit. Proceed immediately. Oh crap, oh crap, oh crap. Come on, come on, come on. Get in there, get in there. There we go. But yeah, there There was not a single There was not a single character in Final Fantasy in Final Fantasy 16 that I feel was miscast. I mean, everyone from Clive to the potion selling girl to mid Like mid mid is such a like mid is such a she's just a bundle of energy. I should be ashamed. I should be downright ashamed of myself for forgetting the GOAT. The absolute un... The, the absolute undisputed GOAT. Uncle fucking Byron. Could have fooled me. Yeah, it's seriously, it, it's not jarring in the slightest. If you hadn't said something about it, Andre, I wouldn't have known. That's how, that is how smooth and how seamless the transition between the voice actors is. But still, Uncle Byron, my god. Like, as a character, Uncle Byron is fucking fantastic. And the, again, the voice acting... Voice acting is just... It is 10 out of 10. Splendid. Gav and... Uh, what's his name? What's his name? Gav and Sir Wade.
Like Ga Gav and Sir Wade were, you know, they they were the they were like two of the closest non-human, sorry, two of the closest human non-dominant bros that Clive has. But, you know, not not to belabor the point. You know, not to belabor the point. You know, the, the first annual backlog, you know, the first annual backlog top shelf award for top voice acting, for top voice acting in a video game. Yeah. It's going to be a three... Oh my god. This is going to sound wrong, but it's a three-way between Ben Starr, Ralph Ineson, and Evan Bailey. Because Clive, Sid, and Uncle Byron. But yeah, we've got... Let's see, that's audio-visual. Let's see, that's, that's AV... That's uh, voice acting. <clears throat> you know what? Let me also go ahead and uh, add. You know, as far as as far as you know, specific audio categories go. Let me also add best singular, the best singular audio track, right? Data, yes, soundtrack itself. I. Yeah. Best soundtrack. Okay, first. First. Let me go best individual song. Best individual song of of games released in 2023. That right there. That will go immediately to Find the Flame. I feel like Find the Flame wound up being just the theme song of 2023 as a whole. Between the lyrics, between, you know... The instance where you first hear it to begin with. <clears throat> like, fight, find the flame. But also, like, while find the flame takes the top spot, I'm going to give you all... I'm going to tell y'all exactly what I saw as the number two. A very close contender. Very close contender for top song of 2023. Rusted Pride from Armored Core 6. go. Pump those numbers up, Saren. <clears throat> but yeah, the, the Titan, the, the, the battle theme for Titan Lost in Final Fantasy 16, yeah, that, that is like the, uh, that track is comparable to Red Sun from Metal Gear Rising. That's that is what I feel in regards to that particular track. You know, it's a 
It's a great song. It's thematic. It fits the character. It fits the battle itself. But, like, just overall composition. Let's see. In terms of composition, in terms of, you know, I guess, what's the word? In, in terms of composition, context, and then just, you know, the sound itself and how it plays off for me. Find the Flame is the top track for 23, and again, you know, the theme song, for, the theme song of 3 as, as a year. But Rusted Pride is definitely, you know, Rust, Rusted Pride definitely hits, hits those high notes for me too. Now, as far as top soundtrack overall, hmm, that's tough. You know, top top soundtrack overall, at least out of what I've played this year, that actually, you know. have to give the top soundtrack overall to Star Ocean, the second story R. I mean, yes, the, the game released this year. Sure, it's a remake. Like, sure, it's a, it's a remake of a game that released, you know, back in you know, 97, 98. Enter the conduit now. Oh, wait, that's it. That's eight zones completed. Sweet. I think I may actually have maxed out this weapon. You know, it's really a shame. Because I didn't get the chance... I still haven't had the chance to play like a Dragon Gaiden or Ishin. right
Oof. A new data conduit is open. Our experiment moves to a new zone. Will I actually be able to make it to zone 10? Hell yeah, I'm at 10, baby. Specimens must experience unmatched stress. Increase your effort. Okay, what are we looking at? Ooh. I found that efficiency stimulus at just the right time. Almost done. But this run was fan freaking tastic. Hunter, you exceed expectations. You are far more exciting and complex than any specimen in my sanctuary. Oh, what? Only to 26? Boo! Okay. So that's audio visuals, that's soundtrack, that's specific songs, that's voice acting. Let's, uh, you know what, that, that was already the first hour. <laughs> Let's go ahead and take our first intermission. I'm going to go get me something to eat, and then when we come back, Top Shelf 2023 continues, and we'll be discussing mechanics, gameplay. Oh, that's going to be a fun one. And you don't want to miss it. Be back in a few.
Welcome back, everybody. Whew. So, burritos are at the ready. Hydration on deck. Oh, hang on. Hang on, hang on, hang on. There's one more thing I need to grab. Sorry. Be right back. Just a uh... Your boy cannot get his Dorito Pope on without Doritos. <laughs> yeah, let's set that over here for now. There we go. But anyways, welcome back to the first annual Top Shelf Awards right here at Ace's Place. And uh, over the course of our first hour, we discussed, you know, different facets of audiovisual design. One's really stood out. At least to me. And, well, which one stood out to the rest of you guys as well over the course of 2023. Now, now we're going to get into the meat and potatoes. Because, you see, once you are attracted to a game by its looks and by its sound, you're going to want to pick the game up, you're going to want to play it, and then you are going to be dealing with how it feels in the hands. That's right. Gameplay. Mechanics. This... This, I feel, more so than even visual design and audio design. A game could be ugly. That's subjective. A game could sound ugly. That is also subjective. But if the game works, if you can get used to the controls, and if those controls... And if the back end of the game is consistent and stable and performs well enough for you to actually enjoy your time with it, oh, see, that right there, again, even more so than audiovisual design, that right there can most definitely make or break a game. With that being said, I need I need to actually discuss a game that I played a game that came out this year that I played that has disappointed on that front So yes while this is the top shelf awards To kind of counterbalance this, while there are those that go on the top shelf at Ace's Place, there are others that go in the dustbin at Ace's Place. So let's get the bad news out of the way first. The one game that I played this year that goes in the dustbin when it comes to gameplay mechanics and stability... Atlas Fallen. Now, for those of y'all that have, you know, for those of y'all that we were that were around back when that game first came earlier this year, and back when I got the chance to play it, you know, I was drawn in by the audiovisual aspects of it. You know, it had, you know, it had. An interesting setting, and from what I had seen of the gameplay, again, visually, it it looked like it was going to be a, you know, it looked like it was going to be a decent action game, right? You know, I'm always, I'm always looking for a good, I'm always looking for a good beat-em-up, I'm always looking for a good hack and slash, I'm always looking for a good <clears throat> Metroidvania slash action exploration game. You know, I'm, I'm always looking, you know... I'm an action junkie, right? And Atlas Fallen had a very unique take on action scene. 
Then I sit down and I get into the game. You know, I'm playing it and, you know, getting used to the, you know, getting used to the controls. And as I'm playing this game, you know, I'm unlocking more and more as I'm going through the first, you know, well, I want to say the first half of the game. But it started to fall off for me. It started to fall off for me because by the time I had opened up all three, by the time I had opened up all three of the main weapons that your character that your character gets and uses over the course of the game. I had already found a setup that works for me. And what's more is that I didn't feel like there was any incentive to experiment. There wasn't much of any ex incentive to experiment with other layouts or other loadouts. You build one, and boom, you just stick with it. You're out. You know, <clears throat> it's off to the races. And then. Then we get to the end game of Atlas Fallen. And that was where a lot of the glaring issues with traversal started to hit. Those glaring issues mainly being that traversal and mobility got very stale. Mm -hmm. Just the, the traversal got stale. And then, more to the point, the traversal and the traversal puzzles during the latter portion of Atlas Fallen it didn't again, it didn't really feel for me like there was much of a reward to it. You know, you complete you complete a traversal puzzle later in the game, <clears throat> and all it gives you as a reward is components for stuff that you got earlier. And I mean, like <clears throat> back during the first half of the game. Third act was very rushed. Anticlimactic. <clears throat> and the game it's like and the game itself, as far as Atlas Fallen goes. The instability was just unacceptable. So yeah, Atlas Fallen, that is your Dustbin 2023 award winner. Clean your shit up.
But with that being said, though, I would <coughs> like to go ahead and talk about our standouts <coughs> for mechanics and gameplay. You know, our top shelf award winners for 2023. And if we're going to go with standout overall mechanics, we're talking a game that just feels good to play. <laughs> oh. Almost made me choke on my burrito. Jerk. <laughs> But nah, real talk. <clears throat> the overall gameplay award for the overall gameplay award. This is once again award. Well, this is one I would actually award to Star Ocean the Second Story R. Top contenders though. Armored Core 6, and Cookie Cutter. But let me pop, let me pop back over to Star Wars in the second story are though. And, you know, let me, you know, let me fill y'all in. Let me, let me fill y'all in on the thought process that went behind this choice. Now, Star Ocean is, of course, a classic JRPG. Back when it came out, now, back when Star Ocean the Second Story first came out on the PlayStation, the combat itself, the exploration, the character progression, it was all pretty straightforward. Rather unique for its time, <clears throat> but still, you know, the game, the game was easy to break <clears throat> up until, I want to say, uh, hmm. the game was relatively easy to break up until you hit, uh, well, up until you hit the post-game dungeons. And then a lot of the difficulties started coming in, you know, because of, you know, certain moves and, you know, how things were programmed. But with Star Ocean... What really grabbed me about the remake was how it took such simple mechanics <clears throat> and such, you know, such a stable core foundation and really built on it. You know, it still has you know char you know it still has character progression where you really feel like you're getting your you're getting good sweat equity out of it you know not just grinding via experience but also leveling up the moves you know you know leveling up the moves as you put points into them or you know as you use them but then with the addition of the shield break mechanics kind of you know, cribbed over from Octopath Traveler. With the addition of those mechanics, plus the sidestepping and blindsiding, which was kind of... I guess you could say the inspiration for that came from... actually from Star Ocean Four, The Last Hope. And how they sort of incorporated that into your defensive game gameplay and your counterplay in in your encounters during the second story arc and 
And then you add to that assault system where, you know, now your characters on the sidelines are actually able to come in and have a more active role <clears throat> in any given combat combat encounter. And this is before the lovely Easter egg they added by giving to have the main protagonists from every other game in the series showing up as assault characters. If you're looking for a game that readily identifies simple to learn but incredibly rich and incredibly deep with constantly more and more layers being just uncovered as you go then Star Ocean the second story R is a game that I would highly recommend just purely from a gameplay standpoint. This game <clears throat> runs smoothly. I did not encounter a single hitch or a single bug or a single crash in the game. It is stable. It is fluid. And the gameplay itself, the actual mechanics, the you know, the but the button feel. is comfortable. So definitely Star Ocean the Second Story R is most definitely the biggest standout gameplay and mechanics wise. At least for me. You know, at least here at the Top Shelf Awards. But Top contender. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. Definitely top contender. Armored Core Six. And here's why. Part of the reason I fell off of the Armored Core series was because late in the PS2 era, around, you know, around Last Raven, the control schemes for, you know, the default control schemes for the games had been changed. And whether or not you can, whether or not you can revert them back to like a classic setup, I'm pretty sure you can. In fact, yeah, you actually can. But with the default control schemes, with the default control schemes being changed, you know, starting, you know, as an option in say, Last Raven and Nexus. But that change going into Armored Core 4 and 5, you know, it just... It kind of took... It kind of took me out of the games for a little bit. You know, even though... Even though you're still building your own mech, Armored Core at core for me was an action game. And I just had trouble getting back into the action with four and you know, basically with the you know, with, with the PS three era games. So Armored Core four, four answer. Five and verdict day. With Armored Core Six, I 
firstly, being able to rebind the keys so that way I can get back to a more get back to that more classic feel for the control layout for Armored Core. That was a huge thing for me. Excuse me. Sorry. That was huge for me. But then, seeing just how well and how smoothly it played after I set the controls back to what I was more used to. You know, it didn't... It didn't feel like the game was trying to overcomplicate its mechanics. You know, it took a... It took a very streamlined and simple approach. It damn near took it back to, you know, the era of Armored Core 2, especially Another Age and Armored Core 3, in terms of the mechanics and the controls. Add to that that, once again, the game has been incredibly stable for me. That, like, Armored Core 6... Has not crashed on me once. And then there is also, as you mentioned earlier, Andre, the freedom and the reward for experimenting with different builds. The creativity that is not only available, but encouraged in Armored Core 6. Mechanically, Armored Core 6 is a true return to form, and it's got it's got something for all of us old school players. It's got something for the players that jumped in on 4 and beyond. Armored Core 6 goes to great lengths. To really bridge the gap. And I welcome it. I welcome it. And I am more than happy to sit down and play more of it. Third runner up for, uh, I'd say third runner-up for, you know, as far as, you know, third runner-up for the, you know, top shelf award for gameplay and mechanics. That's actually going to go to Street Fighter VI. And <clears throat> my reasoning behind that is pretty much the same as my reasoning for Armored Core VI, honestly. It bridges the gap. You know, with, within the drive system in Street Fighter VI are so many callbacks to... You know, so many callbacks to mechanics in previous games that just, you know, really mesh well together. Between... You know, between the drive parry... Let's see, the drive parry, the drive rush, the perfect parry... Overdrive. And then going back... And then stepping outside of that... The fact that... You know, instead of being stuck with... Instead of being stuck with one super... And having... You know... Other... Classic, instantly recognizable moves recognizable supers being relegated to EX or overdrive attacks. No. No, each character technically has four supers, but really three. Level 1, level 2, level 3, and critical. It's like, and level 3 critical. And yes... 
trading away the cinematic story mode for you know for well I wouldn't even say trading away the cinematic mode because I mean the only time you really had like a fully cinematic story mode in Street Fighter was Street Fighter 5 with Shadow Falls But even outside of that, you know, the characters still had their own unique stories when you play the arcade mode with them. But definitely, the character creator and world tour mode, and then, you know, again, having the battle hub being a more social sort of experience, kind of calling back to, you know, calling back to old school arcades, steps in the right direction. So Street Fighter Six is definitely getting credit where it's due. And that's in the gameplay and mechanics. But as far as like the top award for me though, Star Ocean and Armored Core 6 definitely take it. All right, let's uh all set. Service your weapons myself. Well, let's see if I can snag something as far as uh, or we can catalyst real. What's on mind, dreamers? Reactor. Oh, I have enough for a catalyst. Perfect. That's all we have time for. And then This up. Yeah, there. So here's what's next. Uh, I'm looking for. There we go. I'm looking for Volcanic Edge. So we'll put Volcanic Edge there. That'll give us gas. And then I guess I could put shocking touch down here. Mm, toxin radiation. Like toxin radiation, no, that's not what I'm going for. I need electricity and gas. There we go. Now, now we are cooking with grease. <coughs> and I guess I can toss on condition overload. Oh wait, Shocking Touch is plus 90% electricity. But what if I do... What if I do Voltaic Strike? That's a 60-60. So we still have our electricity, we still have our gas, but we've got... Greater status proc, and that's what we need. And what's funny is that out of those three games, as far as, you know, like, cinematic story modes and, you know, single-player offerings go, I hate to say it, but MK11 actually did it the best. 
you know, if you actually got, like, the complete version of the game with Ultimate instead of, you know, <clears throat> instead of getting suckered into buying, you know, the base game and then Aftermath. Newcomers wise, yeah. It's definitely Street Fighter Six takes it. Ooh, those things look even better in uh Orphid Saren's colors. Go through one more uh Oh lovely. Everything in its <coughs> place. One more sexuary assault. I hope so. I really do, because all three of them are great characters. There we go. Just spreading all that damage. Yeet Master Panda.
Dang it. That's what I was looking for. doing
Omega Conduit is open. Our experiment moves to a new zone. Open the new data conduit. Proceed immediately. There we go. All right, one more. Got people leaving the squad already.
new data conduit is open. Our experiment moves to a new zone. Okay, six cleared. I think I'm good with this for now. Hunter, you are running out of time. Enter the data conduit. Sanctuary will go on without you. Okay, so now that we've got those weapons maxed out, and we've had ourselves a pretty decent discussion as far as gameplay mechanics and uh, gameplay content goes. So let's go ahead and take our next intermission. This will give me a chance to stretch, get some more water, crack open the Doritos. Ooh. And uh, we'll come back and we will discuss games that have showcased excellence in crafting scenarios and in crafting narratives. That's right. The story portion of the Top Shelf Awards is coming up right after this intermission. Don't go away. It's going to be great.
Hey, how's it going, everybody? <coughs> Ooh, <coughs> excuse me. Welcome back for, uh, well, welcome back to the next portion of the Top Shelf 2023 Awards. So, we've taken care of, we've done the sights and sounds. There we go. Let's try this again. <clears throat> We've done the sights and sounds. We've done... We've done mechanics. Hey. I'm glad... I'm glad to have had you with us, Winner. And, you know, just like with everyone else, I'm always thankful whenever you show up. So... That said, you get yourself some rest, buddy, and uh, I'll see you in 2024. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, basically, the plan from here... I need to double-check something real fast. I want to make sure I've got... Should I put drifting contact on? Okay, so wait, what if I do this? Let's try drifting contact first. <coughs> Okay, and then once I'm able to, I can move Conditions Perfection up here for the other one that I wanted to add, but we're getting somewhere. Okay, so that's going to do it for Warframe. Let's switch over. So yeah, I did make mention that I was going to be showing off a couple of fighting games that I picked up, because they uh, carry a special place in my memory. Mm. The first of them being this one right here. Now, the Rumblefish Plus is a very unique fighting game. <clears throat> and it'll become immediately apparent once I actually start up arcade mode and pull up the character select. And you'll see... <clears throat> you'll see exactly what we're talking about. And I'll even, you know, go over the mechanics with you real quick. But... If there's one thing where... the Rumblefish isn't so... unique is its story, its plot. You know, it's... All in all, it's a generic sort of, you know, tournament excuse plot to actually bring all these characters together. But the games that we're going to be discussing as far as the uh, Top Shelf Award for standout narrative for games released in 2023, these games are no slouch at all in that department. And, once again, best narrative, best, you know, best, you know, best overall story and scenario direction, For that one, I would definitely say Final Fantasy 16 takes the top spot. Now, 
Now, I'm sure y'all remember back when, back when 16 was first, you know, back when it was first announced. And they were showing bits and pieces of, you know, the prologue of the story. And the two characters that, the two characters that were first mentioned in the, uh, Lead up promotional material were Clive, you know, Clive being the main character of Final Fantasy 16 and how, you know, his start in the story involves him embarking on a quest for revenge because of what happened to his brother, right? Now, at first blush, at first blush, 16, Final Fantasy 16 definitely looks like, you know, it's just going to be stuck as one of those, you know, one of those revenge stories. And not to spoil anything for the folks that haven't played the game yet. Yep, we're on story. Well, for those that haven't played the game yet and don't want to get spoiled on it, I will just say that over the course of its story, Final Fantasy 16 makes a wonderful evolution. From a quest for revenge to like a legitimate quest for justice and to change the world and to change the plight, you know, to change the plight of the people in it. Now, over the course of that narrative, though, again, there's the there's the overarching narrative of Clive's story and Clive's journey. His, well, you could honestly say his hero's journey because he still does grow and evolve as a person over the course of that. But then, the component scenarios, both main and secondary, that make up that journey. are really captivating and hard hitting very well very well written and it's not like it's not like the game is trying hard to be anything else or to reflect something else right I mean, you start the game off with Clive as a young man. <clears throat> First hour or so of the game, prologue, you know, where you're, you know, getting used to the controls, getting used to, getting used to Clive as an individual, you know, as a young individual, you know, the people surrounding him, the events and the environment surrounding him, and then you hit that pivotal point where, basically, his life falls apart. Fast forward a good decade and some change. And now Clive's older and you see him as a you know, you get to experience him more as a fighter, as a soldier. You know, as a man who has just been dragged through the dirt. But still keeps that you know, little shred of his own humanity. And it's from that spark right there that you really start to see more and more, not just of, you know, how the world around him and the people around him are recovering from the events of that fateful night that, you know, that fateful night that 
essentially ruined Clive's life. <clears throat> get to see more of how he has recovered and how he is persevering. And it's that... It's that underlying... That underlying theme of perseverance that really... You know, it, it really strikes a chord with me. And in addition to that narrative, there's just... Each character... Each character you encounter in Final Fantasy XVI feels like they have their own to tell. That story is told through the events in the game and their actions, not just through a dialogue dump or exposition dump. It feels very human, very organic. And I could cite numerous examples of great ser great scenario direction, like, you know, accept the truth. Or, you know, when Clive reunites with his mother. Hell, when Clive... Spoilers! When, when Clive meets certain other characters that were important to him in his youth. Right? The, the revenge aspect has a, carries a lot of nuance, and it's not just on... You know, it's not just on Clive's end, too. I mean, hell! You, you almost get a mirror of... You almost get a mirror of what's going on with Clive in... Hugo Kupka. Again, a lot of what happens there, spoilers, and I am not going to spoil this for that hasn't played through the game already. All I can say is, if you want a great story, an expertly told story, and one that will most definitely keep you turning the pages in that book, keep you, keep you playing and playing, like, if it wasn't for the fact that I had work and had to, you know, kind of take care of adult stuff around the apartment and take care of myself, I would have sat down and just probably played through the entirety of Final Fantasy 16 in one sitting. That is how gripping the narrative in that game is. And then later on in the game, once the stakes really start to ramp up... Well, the ramping up of the stakes in the story is also very subtle, very nuanced. But at the point where you see the stakes have really risen and, you know, those moments where you go, it's about to go down... It still comes as a surprise when it happens, but then when you take a couple seconds to like really think about it and think about the lead ups to it, and you start noticing certain things, that's like, oh my god, it really is about to go down. <laughs> now, just really quickly. As I was mentioning earlier about the Rumblefish, this is a very unique fighting game. Let me go ahead and get a quick match started here. Who was I going to use? Actually, you know what? Let's go ahead and get this started, get a little bit of action in before we continue here.
damn counters. Ah. Oh boy. All right. Well, actually, let's get back to this real quick. That's the end of the round. Damn. You lose. Final round. Now, you notice how he actually, how he actually looks, you know, beat up and his clothing was torn. That actually displays on his character model and it looks like it's permanent, you know, th between matches, which is a nice touch that I didn't even recognize from the arcade version of the game. But, let's wrap it back around to what we were talking about here with the Top Shelf Awards and uh, Narrative. So yeah, Final Fantasy 16, from the writing to the scenario direction, the whole nine yards. That game takes it. Top contenders. Both for various reasons, but the top contenders there... Armored Core 6, once again. And Cookie Cutter. Now, Cookie Cutter is definitely an example of, you know, you uncovering more of the game, uncovering more of the story as you play through the game, because it's not quite, I mean, you get a basic intro, but it's not quite apparent just, you know, how rich and how much is going on in that world. It's not apparent until you know, you've actually played through more of the game. You've interacted with the NPCs and interacted with the little, you know, transmission logs that you find over the course of the game. With Cookie Cutter, it's the simplicity and the execution. Armored Core 6 has a different quality to it. Not only is the story in Armored Core 6 expansive, and the scenarios, but the story and the setting for Armored Core 6 is probably told... It's told in such a way that... While there is no... That's how I, that's how I wanted to put it. <clears throat> in Armored Core 6, the narrative is told through numerous entities... But it's like the humanity 
as in, you know, the organic component is taken out. <coughs> Every character you run into in Armored Core 6, <coughs> they're depicted as more or less, you know, either a voice over digital communications or <coughs> the different mechs, the different Armored Cores that you actually face off against over the course of the game. And that's everybody. If their name is mentioned, or you hear their voice in Armored Core 6, best believe there's a mech tied to them. Even with zero actual human characters on screen. Like, in a world and in mega structures where everything is just so metallic and digital and mechanical. Every single character in Armored Core 6 feels so incredibly human that you know you just can't help but get attached to them you know Wal Walter for example yeah he's your handler but as you play through the game like as you as you play through the game you know Walter is really you know Walter is like you know that tough no nonsense friend that's guiding you through these missions. Yeah, how how each of the characters relates to and responds to you as an entity yourself you know, changes and evolves over the course of the game. I mean, the best example of this, I could say, best example of this, hands down, is, you know, the dialogue and the interactions with, with Michigan. And just how, as you do more and achieve more in Armored Core 6 over the course of the narrative, you know you're you're racking up those you're racking up those milestones, and it's like, you know, Michigan really had his eye on you after that first mission, and it shows, and the respect he has for you as a pilot shows. And I'm not gonna lie. Two points in the game. Two points in the game that had me just damn near ready to you know, I was I was getting a little emotional. Two points in the game that had me getting emotional. One Chatty. The mission where I had to fight Well, no. Firstly The mission near the end where Chatty gets taken out by V2 Snail. Dog, I was mad. I was like, oh no, you killed my boy. You gotta go. Sorry, I wasn't 
I forget whether it was... I forget whether it was Snail or Freud that takes him out. But... When Chatty gets killed, I get mad. But that mission replay where you... Where we have to take out Carla and Chatty, that is heartbreaking. There's that. And the ending where you gotta fight air. Like, I feel like both of those scenes, they just hit... You know, they hit something really emotional deep down. Now, the final Rusty fight, that's not bittersweet for me. No, that is... That's that's a different sort of feeling that comes to mind, because it's like... You know, Ru Rusty definitely... Definitely winds up being, like, one of your boys, one of your best friends by the end of it. Like, seriously, it seems like... I feel like the narrative and the characters and characterizations in Armored Core 6... It's like a different take on how Final Fantasy 16 does it, in that... Well, not a different take so much as, like... You know, a different side to that same coin, because, you know, Final Fantasy 16, you know, it has all this production, there's all this dialogue, there's, you know, the actual interactions face-to-face -face between characters like Clive and Jill, or Clive and Sid, right? And, there you can really feel the humanity between the characters, the relatability between the characters as it plays out on screen, but with Armored Core 6... It's a sort of minimalism. In that, again, you know, everyone is represented by just, you know, voice transmissions. Or, again, if you see these characters, what you're seeing of them is the ACs they pilot. And there's still such a feeling of anachronistic humanity that permeates Armored Core 6. But, yeah, just to kind of, you know, wrap that up a little bit. You know, when it comes to narratives, scenario direction, and of course, you know, major standouts of the year. That goes to, you know, that goes to, in particular, Final Fantasy 16 and Armored Core 6. But, uh, let's talk about it for a little bit while I go through some more of this. Uh, what, you know, what, what games, you know, what games and stories over the course of the year have you guys been interested in and had just, you know, such a fantastic time with? Hmm. 
Yeah, you did mention, uh, Like a Dragon Gaiden. Chained Echoes? <clears throat> That's another one I'll have to check out. Mm. Okay. Yeah, the story behind Metal Gear Solid 2 is... It's... It's wild. Game over. Thank you for your participation. Hmm.
Yeah, definitely gonna need to brush up on this a little bit. Hmm. Right, it's that... options out real fast. Uh... Okay, I can't do that. But yeah, you know, just While I did say, you know, gameplay and mechanics are definitely one of those things that can make or break. Make or break a game. You know, everything from the mechanics to the scenario direction to the audiovisual. You know, it all, it all ties together. Because, you know, if you're playing a game that, you know might have excellent controls, but you know, you can't really get into it because you're not really feeling the story or you're not really feeling the characters, then you know, you might pick it up you might pick up the game and play every now and again now and again, but it's not gonna be long term, you know. There's not gonna be that longevity. Whereas a game could be ugly. But <clears throat> while it might slightly diminish your enjoyment of the game, if the narrative and the scenario direction is still solid and the controls are comfortable, you'll likely stick to it. 
But you could have the prettiest game with what might potentially be some of the best storytelling. But if you can't stand playing it, or the game is busted, or the game is unstable, then best believe, a person's going to regret their purchase. Flat out. So with that being said, we are coming up on, we're coming up on hour number three. So our next intermission, and then when we come back, I'll finally actually tell y'all what's going on with me and the Rumblefish and, you know, my particular memories with this game, but we'll also... We'll also get down to, you know, what I finally consider the meat and bones of this whole thing. You know, the games that put all of it together, from the gameplay to the scenario direction to the audio and visual design. But have also done so and given great value proposition for the time spent with those games. The games that are going to give you the be best bang for your buck, in addition to being top shelf in all of the other technical categories that I've mentioned earlier. So, when we come back, we're going to have best in value proposition, which is going to dovetail right into the actual game of the year picks for your favorite rookie. I'll catch you on in a little bit, so don't go away.
Sorry. Chewing on some. Just chewing on some gummy starfish. <laughs> Anyways. Welcome back, everybody. It's great to see you. And, uh. Yeah. Let's, uh. To say that this year has been eventful, even in trying to summarize it, I still feel like I'm selling 2023 short. You know, I feel like <clears throat> I feel like saying that this year has been eventful is in a lot of ways undervaluing. Wait a minute, why did what the heck? Not entirely sure why I saved that, but let's go ahead and delete that. <clears throat> but I feel like... I don't want to undervalue what 2023 has brought or underestimate you know the challenges that this year and the next well that this year has that this year had in store and what the next year will have in store for us with that being said As it relates to, <clears throat> as it relates to the backlog, as it relates to the top shelf, award, it relates to how I evaluate the games that I play and the games that I stream. I'm sure you all know this by now, but one thing that is highly, you know, one thing that, one thing that is paramount in my estimations of games and the content that I consume is, you know, whether or not it's really worth the price of admission, whether or not, whether or not I feel like, you know, whether or not I think a person would get plenty of value out of the time, no, out of the time or the money, you know, out of the currency that they spend, right? Let's turn that down just a little bit. There we go. Ooh. They have scan they have a scan line graphics filter. But anywho. Like one one of the big things that I use as an estimation you know, as my own personal estimation of any content that I consume, is your value proposition, right? And the way I see it, you always want to break even. You know, take, take it back to the 90s, right? When you go to an arcade, you get proficient enough at a game, you're going to be spending at least you're going to be spending an hour in the arcade for every dollar that you put into the machine. Doesn't matter if you're playing The Simpsons or if you're playing Killer Instinct. You could be playing X-Men Children of the Atom. You could be playing Street Fighter VI. One quarter. One credit. And, you know, once you, once you get to a high enough standard with a particular game, especially with, like, fighting games, you could clear the arcade mode in 15 to 20 minutes. You'll average an hour 
per dollar. It's that measurement, that that measurement of value proposition right there, which serves as the linchpin, the under, you know, the foundation of my review criteria. So with that being said, let's just go ahead and get right on into it. The games that have offered, offered the best value proposition for 2023. <clears throat> And also, my top game of the year picks for this year. So, laying it all out on laying it all out on the table. Top shelf, twenty twenty three. I can't narrow it down to just one game as far as whether or not it's my game of the year. There's, there's no way possible because there has been a single game that has just completely like blown everything else out of the water, right? But that's when you know it's a good year. If there is, you know, if there's one game that's just like, you know, firing on all cylinders, but then you want into at least one, maybe two more that do the that hit those same you know, that hit those same benchmarks for you. Like that's when you know you've been able to find something that it was worth spending your money on. <clears throat> so my three top shelf games for 2023 I mean, it's pretty obvious from the discussion, again, pretty obvious from my discussion over the course of this year in general. But, in no particular order, Top Shelf 2023 goes to Final Fantasy 16, Armored Core 6, and Cookie Cutter. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, even though there have been various games... You know, there have been different games that I've mentioned in each of the standalone categories, like voice acting, like visual design, like audio, like mechanics, you know? These three games have provided quality and stability consistently across all measurable, important metrics. Or at least, you know, again, all measurable, important metrics as relates, as pertains to my estimation of the content. Remember, this is all subjective. Whether you agree or not, that's the, that's the beauty of the hobby. But if you're looking for games that are just the complete package and so much of a complete package that I have spent so much time not only playing, enjoying these games, then, you know, it... You know that that right there is what uh, you know. That's that's what does it for me. That's that is what determines a top shelf game. Final Fantasy sixteen, spectacular visual design. I mean, it's you know it's a Square Enix Final Fantasy game. You expect them to come out. You, know, you expect them to come out swinging. Going for the dark, you know, going for the medieval dark fantasy setting and aesthetic. You know, when they when they started working on this game, you know, content like Game of Thrones was still pretty big. So that right there, most definitely uh, 
played a hand in played a hand in their design choice. You had the usual suspects whining and bitching about how how there's no diversity in Final Fantasy 16. <clears throat> and the team was very about it saying, "Hey, the setting for this game is modeled quite heavily after medieval Europe." So, of course, it's not going to be as ethnically or, you know, it's not going to be as ethnically diverse as, you know, most countries are today. That's just how it happens. But in keeping with that setting... In keeping with that setting... They were really able to go all out, not just with, you know, not just with the set pieces, but also with the environments, with the monster designs, with the character designs in general. And between that, the solid and incredibly fun and quite smooth, almost seamless gameplay. You know, there's not much in the way of exploration and traversal because, you know, it's mostly on foot. It's not like you're, like, you know, flying... It's not like you're actually flying in an airship or, like, you know, jumping from mountain to mountain using your superpowers and stuff. No. A lot of it's very grounded. And even when it gets to the more fantastical stuff like Clive's abilities, you know, you, there's still that weight to it that I really like. And the icon system working as, yeah, as basically an evolution of, you know, the summons. I'm looking forward to, yes, I did actually manage to pick up Echoes of the Fallen, so I'm looking forward to playing that eventually too. But... There's that. There's the sound design and voice acting, of course. The music, fantastic. And again, going back to the value proposition itself. On release, the game was 60 bucks. Easily spent double that. I easily spent double... I usually spent double that amount in game time. And as it stands, Final Fantasy 16 still has my still has my highest value proposition estimation. Like I spent 2 hours playing this game for every it's like I spent two hours playing and enjoying Final Fantasy 16 for every dollar that went into it. So that is a game that I would very easily... Well, oh. That's the kind of game that would damn near make me consider paying 70 for. And y'all know how I feel about... You know, the price increases and everything. And how, you know, all, you know, all the, you know, all the, you know, prices on games are going up. And yet, consumers were supposed to be seeing savings with the whole shift to all digital. Final Fantasy 16, again. Two hours of enjoyment per dollar spent on the game itself. And hell yeah, I feel like I broke even at 60. Armored Core 6. Same thing. Broke broke even at $60. 
well worth well worth the playthrough. The the visual design fantastic. Like if I if I ever wanted to play a mech game or watch a mech anime, I would just throw on Armored Core Six. That would be my instinct. The voice acting, the sound design and foley and foley design for the machinery, the the weaponry, everything. It's atmospheric. It's engaging. It's engrossing. The music is fitting. And I wouldn't even call the music atmospheric because as you play through each of the missions, it's not like it fades into the background so much as it it infuses everything that is going on around you. And again, certain tracks that play, like again, Rusted Pride. Like when when you hear Rusted Pride start to play, you know the game is about to hit one of its one of its high points. And that's saying something considering Armored Core 6. The narrative of the game Detailing, you know, detailing, you know, a struggle with humanity. You know, the struggle between corporations and the denizens, you know, and the native residents of this, you know, this ravaged, this ravaged world. Rubicon. It's... It really is a sight to behold. And playing through the game itself, the mobility and the power of every build you can put together from, you know, from a lightweight skirmisher to a gargantuan missile boat. All of it is so expertly expressed that the only way I could think of someone possibly disliking Armored Core 6 would be if they just weren't really into giant robots to begin with. Which, hey, that's your prerogative. And then there's Cookie Cutter. Now, Cookie Cutter, again, just from start to finish, Cookie Cutter had that vibe of distilled 90s counterculture. Cyberpunk, grunge, metal, alternative, all that just... All that just it it oozed style. It oozed style, and that style was most definitely not wasted. Between between the narrative of the game, your introduction to characters like Cherry and Raz, like Shinji. Salem. And then if you go from the narrative of the game to, again, the core gameplay itself. You know, to the atmospheric, you know, the ambient music which, you know, really swells and starts to hit hard when you hit the major encounters. Or when you hit the major story points outside of, outside of combat. Like, 
cookie cutter brought style and heart from a very much indie indie developer and studio. And it's that it's that comparatively grassroots sort of origin for the game itself as a product. Combined with the quality and the support that the game has been provided. Oh, that right there just immediately... That right there immediately catapulted it to, you know, again, top shelf competitor. When Cookie Cutter came out, just a week or so ago now, 20 bucks. And I got that equivalent amount of time. 20 hours out of that game. I plan on going back to it. I plan on... Oh! Armored Core 6, Final Fantasy 16, and Cookie Cutter are three games that I not only played, but enjoyed thoroughly. Got... Like, got bare minimum my one-to-one -one value proposition out of them. But what's more, these are games that I am actually willing and wanting to go back and get the Platinum Trophies for. And that is a rare occurrence. So, with that being said, firstly, Happy New Year from the past to the future, Cinerous. And, yeah. With that said, though, that's my top shelf. That is my Game of the Year picks for 2023. If you haven't picked up these games yet, please do so. You will not you will not go wrong with Cookie Cutter, with Armored Course, and with Final Fantasy 16. So, with the review and analysis stuff out of the way, with the year in recap out of the way, let me finally give you all that little bit of ace lore in regards to uh, myself and the games in the Rumblefish collection. I first stumbled across this series all the way back on the PS2, right? Like, I saw... I saw an advertisement for the first game. I'm like, what the hell is this? Looked up some videos. So I imported the game for my PS2. And in importing that game, what I also did, and this was... Okay, I imported the game through PlayAsia. Right? I imported the game through PlayAsia. And then I went to I went to a local shop out in San Bernardino and got myself one of those trans one of those those transparent blue shells for my PS2, right? Because you know, tra transparent tech was the, the in thing at the time. Transparent blue shell. Put that bad boy on, got my little mod got my little swap magic mod disc, got the rumblefish too. No, not two, the first one. Got the rumblefish. Threw it in, started playing through the game, had a blast. This was what? Yeah, 2004, 2005. Later on that year, I went to the parrot. The Southern California paradise of arcade gamers known as Arcade Infinity. I saw the Rumblefish there. And right next to it, on another cabinet, was the Rumblefish 2. 
and I have been chopping at the bit to get to play these games once again ever since. So seeing, so the moment I had seen that these games were being ported over to the PS4 and the PS5, specifically for TRF2, I was stoked. I had to get on that shit. And then come the end of the year sales on PlayStation Network and I'm like, I pay less than 20 bucks and I get, and I get two of my sleeper favorites from Arcade Infinity to play on my PS5? Hell yes! I am in there like swimwear. And here we are. Okay. We'll try this again, but after... After I turn off that retro filter. That's better. Hmm. What games am I looking for? Ooh. There we go. There we go. That's the... That'll be our prologue. That'll be our end game for the Top Shelf Awards. The games that I'm the most hyped for that have been announced so far for next year. And you know what? Or, you know, again, just games that I'm hyped to tackle next year. If there's one in particular that I'm really looking forward to, it's Grand Blue Fantasy. Dragon's Dogma 2. Mm-hmm, that's another one. But yeah, Grand Blue Relink, Grand Blue Relink, Dragon's Dogma 2. See, I'm looking forward to Like a Dragon, Infinite Wealth. And... Tekken 8.
Ooh. Yeah, Met Metaphor Refantasio looks good, too. Now, as far as games that... You know, as far as games that are already out that I own that I'm looking forward to tackling... Well, I'm definitely looking forward to finishing up Monster Hunter World. Yeah, that one I'm definitely going to finish up in 24. Uh... You know, I think I might actually go back through and give Dynasty Warriors 9 a fair shake, too. I still have yet to finish that. Let's see, I still have to finish that. I still have to finish Yakuza 7. I still have to finish Star Ocean 6. Let's see. Control, God of War, and God of War Ragnarok... Of course, 16's DLCs, you know, finish up Bomber Rush Cyberfunk. You know, in addition to the stuff that's coming out next year, I feel like we've got ourselves a good enough backlog that, you know, we'll be able to stream, chill, and have fun, and, you know, make this a great place for folks to hang out for the foreseeable future. And this is even including, of course, you know, this even includes, you know, me going back to work. God, the damage on that. Looks like we're actually, uh... It looks as though we're actually, uh... You know, it looks as though we're all 
pretty hyped for a lot of the same games coming out. I'm, I'm looking forward to all of us sharing the experience, you know? You mean Y2K or? What? Yeah, Yik is right.
すぐに這いつくばらせてあげるからあんたのガンダ君いただくべThat's going to be the ex that's going to be the important question. Did it actually get better or worse with that story revamp?
Okay, so what exactly did they do for the combat? Because I remember it being like... I remember it being some kind of turn-based.
Ooh. Okay. I need to get one more stretch. Now I'm coming up on the four hour mark. This is perfect. So yeah. Let me go ahead and take that last stretch. And then uh, we'll probably cut back over to some more Warframe, maybe a little Monster Hunter after the intermission. But uh, for everyone else that was uh, wanting to check out my picks for Game of the Year 2023, that was the backlog. That was the Top Shelf Awards. So we got one more hour of just hanging out and, you know, getting in some game time. We'll be coming back right after the intermission, so don't go away.
Whew. Uh, apologies for the uh, longer than expected intermission. Uh, gotta love those bathroom breaks, huh? But anyways, uh, let's go ahead and get in just a little bit more game time on Warframe to kind of, you know, round it off. You know, kind of end the year. Or at least end the streaming year on a nice sort of tidy point. But one thing I am definitely looking forward to doing in 2024 is continuing to stream as consistently as I can with a more defined or at the very least, you know, with a more pre-planned schedule. You know, once I, uh, you know, once I'm back to work again, you know, the plan is to make sure that I know what my days off are going to be looking like, what my schedule is going to be looking like, at least a week in advance, so that way I can plan the stream schedule for that, work around that, and make sure I've got great stuff ready for you guys. And uh, what I'm also probably going to wind up doing is, you know, when I'm gaming off stream, I'll be making sure to put up more clips and, you know, upload more stuff directly to YouTube from the you know, from the PS5. You know, maybe do some arcade mode playthroughs in certain games. I mean, you never know. Well, you never know, but I'm going to make sure that you knew, make sure that you do know beforehand, so that way you're ready for it and you're ready to come in and check it out. Nora is all about incentivizing. Okay, the weekly stuff is back, so we've got. Kill enemies, complete missions, kill Xmas, diff five different steel path missions, crack relics, standing, secondary Still weapon, bit. and gas damage. Right. All set. Service your weapons myself. Okay, so we're definitely going to want to cut down on the stuff that is the most expensive. Let's take a screenshot right here. And then... Oh, I don't have any more stance for me. Going to need to fix that. But for now, let's go ahead and... Uh, Pop for condition overload. Nice, and doing so allows me to keep the loadout. Let's get out there and let's have some fun. Oh, lovely. Everything in its place. Those gas clouds. Yes.
already at a hundred enemies. a new data conduit. Proceed immediately. So Cinerus, you still watching? Man. Okay, so So, the these blades that I'm using right now, the the dual ichor plus freaking plus melee influence. And then I modded this thing for gas and electric for gas and electric status. Like I, I haven't, I haven't, you know, gotten the like the perfect on this yet. But bro, this is getting stupid. This is getting real stupid, real fast. Like cats are spawning in and dying. Okay, like this. I mean, just look at the spread. farts.
This is almost embarrassing. Almost. On it like paint. So that's Eximus units killed. That's 500 enemies in total killed. And then some. Space COVID! The only herd immunity that will save you is death. Electric farts!
the new data conduit. Proceed immediately. All right, let's go, let's go, let's go. If I'm able to do this kind of stuff, I'm sure what I can do on Steel Path. Enter the now. Fever pitch. You create fascinating reading hunters. Do not stop me. Got it. We got some deserters. Whoop. There we go. Go.
is open. Go now. Oh, I got an A plus on that one? Nice. Alright, here we go, here we go. It's no one A. Let's clear this out. That hangnail hurt. Twenty-six infected, and the damage just grows. is open. Our experiment moves to a new zone. Moving on to zone 9.
opened a new data conduit. Proceed immediately. Excuse me. So sorry. A new data conduit is open. Our experiment moves to a new zone. Hunter, you are running out of time. Enter the data conduit. Nah, I'm good. Sanctuary will go on without you. Boom. Rank 30. So yeah, I think I think I may very well have my Nito setup. Nora sleeps better knowing her dreamers are out there working to lift us up. So then Open one of each relic. I think I can do that. More for me.
just got a little bit more time left. We received intel that somebody vital to enemy operations is here. Find them and capture them. Void fishers, you need them to open a relic, but are you confident you can withstand their fury? A fisher, defend yourself and use reactant to open relics. They're dropping reactant. Use it to crack open a relic. Keep fighting. Look for more reactant. Stay focused. There's a heavy unit approaching. We cannot let our target know we're here. Track them down quickly. You found a target. Capture them quickly before they escape. Excellent work. We'll interrogate the captive back at base. Your part is done here, Tenno. The relic has been cracked open. Finish your mission to find out what's inside. Thank you. I'll take that. Someone was bound to have that. We'll interrogate the captive back at base. Your part is done here, Tenno. You know what? I think I think I'm gonna go ahead and uh, let's bring this to a close, shall we, everybody? Uh new transition. <laughs> ah, alrighty. So. Let's recap, shall we? This year, this year was chock full of action, chock full of just, you know, a lot could be said as far as making a case for this being not necessarily the best year in gaming, but a certainly a good one. Uh, a case could be made that... You know, this year was a pretty damn good year for me, too. Just on a personal level. I hope the same could be said for the rest of y'all. Hmm. But, with, uh, with 2023 coming to a close, again, I just want to, well, send out a huge, 
huge shout out and huge thanks to everybody that's you know everybody that's ever come through and either had me on their streams or you know came through and hung out here you know we've you know anyone who's you know just operator any of you that have shared your irreplaceable time here with me either supporting this channel supporting me you know just Again, y'all, y'all helped keep me alive this year. Y'all saved my life, and that is no exaggeration. There's a lot that I'm sure we want to try and get done. There's a lot that I'm sure we want to try and get done within, you know, over the course of this coming year. And honestly... If you have a New Year's resolution, the best I can say is you should have already started on it. Like when it, whenever you whenever you whenever you make a New Year's resolution for yourself, start on that resolution a month in advance. Why? Because if you do something consistently for at least 30 days, I have seen this, I have done this myself. If you do something consistently, for 30 days. By the time you hit day 30, you will have made it a routine. You will have made it a part of your life. In which case, your New Year's resolution becomes less of a chore and so much easier to get done. And honestly, the goal is always to improve. The goal is always to be a better person, a better professional, a better whatever you identify yourself as. The goal is to be better. The goal is to do better. Hopefully, I can count on you guys to fight towards your goals alongside me fighting along alongside me fighting towards mine. If we're all heading in the same direction, our paths will cross, and we can help each other. And now, for that daily reminder. The last reminder of 2023. What feels like the end is often the beginning. I mean, there's, there is nothing else that can really be said to sum that up, you know? So long as you're, well, hell, even then, you know, so long as you exist, there's always a next step, a next phase, a next chapter. Sooner or later, you're going to reach a door that is going to open for you. It's up to you to stand on your own two feet and walk through it. Whether you're walking through it by yourself or whether you're walking through it together with others. Just keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. And whenever you hit a major milestone, whenever you complete something that you set out to accomplish, go into the, you know go into celebrating that accomplishment with the mindset that there is lots more where that came from. Because the more you do. And the more you push yourself to believe that about yourself, the more often you'll prove yourself right.
There's more where that came from. Lots more. Take that with you into 2024 and make it a damn good one, people. We'll have ourselves a uh, we'll have ourselves a New Year's gaming stream, and we are going to start it off. We're going to start off 2024, jumping back into some more Monster Hunter World for Monster Hunting Monday. Until then, if you haven't celebrated the countdown yet, whatever time zone you're in, if you're overseas and you have already hit 2024, Happy New Year to you. If you haven't yet, enjoy the countdowns. Enjoy the celebrations. Stay safe. Play it smart. Make sure that you see the next sunrise. Because I'm going to be looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. But until then, until 2024, remember these big four rules. Stay happy. Stay hydrated. Stay gaming. And once more, for everybody in the back, stay good, neighborhood. Have yourselves an incredible new year. And I'll see you at noon, January 1st, 2024. Later.